Hello, this is Gwenda Joyce, host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network. Welcome to today, today's show. According to the Organization for Freedoms, freedom is defined by participation, not ideology. Through nonpartisan programming, the nonprofit organization, which was founded in 2016 by artists Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman, started art partnerships and programs around the country with arts organizations and artists to deepen their public discussion on civic issues and core values of our democracy. These goals are important to everyone, and the goal of broadening the opportunities for discussion is one of the main mainstays of our democracy. And to give artists and other people a venue for more nuanced presentation, incorporating artistic values, and to become engaged in public life is something that I hold very dear, so that when I have heard about Four Freedoms, I definitely wanted to represent what they're doing on this Art Ambassador radio show. So I welcome you here to join in the discussion. Uh, we're here to dis- to support the notion that participation is the core of a democracy, and that it's not the ideology, but the representative democracy that we're all participating in. My two guests today are from two different arts organizations. They're curators Courtney Gilbert from the Sun Valley Center for the Arts and curator Kate Crawford from the Birmingham Museum of the Arts. And they're here with me today and we're going to have a discussion of how this initiative has been picked up by their institutions and become the center for their creative programming and uh, exhibitions. So I'm going to start by welcoming Kate Crawford of the Birmingham Museum to the show. Welcome, Kate. So good to have you on the Art Ambassador Radio Show. Hi, Gwenda. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm really delighted to speak with you and to have you uh, be represented as um, the voice of what's happening at the Birmingham Museum of Art and going on with your arts programming in Alabama. So yeah, please, if, yeah, yeah. So let's get started. Uh, tell me about how you came to uh, hear about the Four Freedoms. Uh, organization and their initiative and and then how it evolved into having you the Birmingham Museum uh, participate with some programming sure uh, you know for freedoms has always been uh, in the orbit of the Birmingham Museum of Art I would say in part because the museum is very interested in the work of Hank Willis Thomas who of course is one of the two artist founders of the four freedoms organization Additionally, in 2016, when Four Freedoms first got off the ground um, and they were installing billboards across the United States, one of the sort of regions that they really targeted for their messaging was the southeastern United States. And so Four Freedoms has really been in the orbit of the Birmingham Museum of Art and vice versa um, for some time, I would say, really since their inception. But what was particularly exciting for us was when last spring there was actually a statewide initiative pulled together across Alabama to bring a number of cultural organizations to the table to do different exhibitions, town halls, billboards, and yard sign installations in conjunction with For Freedom's mission in the lead up to the the midterm elections this year. Well, I am particularly interested in this yard signs installations, and we're going to get to that later, but as as soon as that... uh, as soon as you mention that, I get a visual of people really voicing their support and their opinions right out there on the front yards. And isn't that just a typically American thing to do? So before we get into that, tell us about the exhibition uh, that you decided to put on at the museum, uh, where that came from and, and what it's about. I know it's up now. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, the exhibition opened on September 8th, and we've called it Four Freedoms, Civil Rights, and Human Rights. Um, The pre-colon title, Four Freedoms, is F-O-R, Freedoms, like the nonprofit. 
Um, but of course, it's referencing the four freedoms Franklin Delano Roosevelt mentions in his 1941 um, State of the Union address. And so what we've done is actually pull four works of art, um, one to represent each of those four freedoms. And those are freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom of worship. And so um, we've either chosen works by artists from Alabama or artists who have a close connection to Alabama, again, because this is a statewide initiative throughout Alabama. Um, and we were really pulling works of art that spoke to those four freedoms that were made during the civil rights era. Um, and I think part it's of very... what we wanted to Oh, go ahead. No, I was I was going to comment that I think it's very telling and and um, significant that the um, four freedoms that you referenced uh, in uh, Del- uh, Franklin Delano Ro- Roosevelt's State of the Union address in 1941 were also the subject of a series of paintings of four freedoms that. Norman Rockwell created in 1943. So there is going back this history, uh, you know, art historically, to taking those ideas and turning them into visual images. So tell us more about your show. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the Norman Rockwells, because I think they really influenced Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman in pulling together the Four Freedoms Initiative. And they definitely influenced me in thinking about those four freedoms through the civil rights era, living in Birmingham, Alabama, where that's a constant presence for us, Um, as opposed to thinking about that earlier moment when Franklin Delano Roosevelt sort of identifies those four freedoms. Um, I was really excited to think about how freedom changes or doesn't change between 1940 and 1960. Um, and so we pulled together uh, photographs by Spider Martin, who's a, an important photographer documenting the civil rights era. Um, Elliot Erwitt, who happens to be traveling through the American South. He's really more of a commercial and fashion photographer, but he takes um, a couple of really poignant images in the American South in the 1950s. Um, Norman Lewis, who, of course, is working in New York City, but is looking very closely as an African-American artist who's painting in Harlem is looking very closely at what's happening in Alabama, in particular in the 1960s. And then Chris McNair, who's actually a Birmingham native, um, who photographed the 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963, a really central location for the movement, kind of um, thinking through those four freedoms and uh, how they'd shifted from 1940, how they were maybe different in 1960 for African Americans than they were in 1940 for the white Americans that Rockwell's representing. Are you able, to, through these images, to draw some conclusions about those kinds of changes? Um, you know, um, no. And I think in some ways that was our desire because we actually have a fifth object represented in the installation. Um, it's a work from Carrie James Marshall's Memento series, and uh, it was created in the 1990s. What we wanted to do was instead sort of, um, instead of giving our conclusions to our visitors who are coming to this exhibition, we really wanted to ask them what they thought changed between 1940 and 1960, and between 1960, say, and 1990, or 1960 and today. Um, I think more than drawing conclusions, we were looking to say the civil rights era never ended. It didn't end in Birmingham, and it hasn't ended for the United States. What do you value freedom of, and where do you want things to go? That's such an important question, Kate, and it's an important question that arts organizations can ask to their communities, and this is one of the values of art. We're going to be talking more about the initiative and the presentations at the Birmingham Museum of Art after we take a short break. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and I'm here today talking with Curator of American Art, Kate Crawford, at the Birmingham Museum of Art in Alabama. Uh, Currently, their programming includes a very interesting presentation dealing with issues of democracy, uh, as inspired by the Four Freedoms initiative that is in partnership with programs in all 50 states. 
I'd love to hear more, Kate, about how you're taking these, uh, this idea and this initiative out into the community. You have a very interesting lawn sign event going on today. Uh, tell us what that's all about. It's actually, we're installing the lawn signs tomorrow morning. <laughs> Um, so oh, we'll be great. out there okay. stomping, stomping them into our front yard. Um, but as part of this sort of uh, question that we've posed to our community in terms of what they value with regard to their freedoms, we've actually asked them to fill out yard signs, um, which we then will be, we've collected and we will be installing on the front lawn of the museum, giving people a little bit of ownership in an installation at the museum. Well, I think that's great, and I, I am sure that there's no curatorial bent here, and the, the signs don't have to be artistic. Uh, have you given any parameters for, for or any messages that, uh, to the people who want to create signs, or is this open to everyone? It's open to everyone. Um, For Freedoms is a nonpartisan initiative. That's really an important part of their messaging, and it's something we've tried to do as well. And so we're just encouraging people to articulate what they value more than anything else. Um, that That's said, so we important. do have. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah, it is. And I think um, people don't always feel like their voice has a place to be heard in a museum. And so giving them that opportunity has been really exciting. Yes, and I would love to uh, be able to do it myself. So I want to invite all of those of you who are close by Birmingham and near to the museum to feel like you can participate in this event. Do you have any parameters uh, for the public, Kate, in, in terms of what they can put on signs or sizes and those kinds of things? Well, For Freedoms has actually done yard sign installations across the country. Um, so they provide the templates for the signs. So mm-hmm. our signs articulate um, those four freedoms, again, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt shared. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, we don't give people any parameters. And we've also been really deliberate in not getting rid of any signs. So people can really express whatever it is that they're grateful for freedom of or freedom from. That's just such a great opportunity. And now I know you've taken this idea out into the community and out into the high schools, and you're planning a town hall meeting next Thursday night. This is a very exciting opportunity for young people to get involved and really practice expressing themselves even before they have the chance to vote. Uh, Tell us about this. Yeah, I think I think it is an exciting opportunity for young people. Um, the Birmingham City Schools have a really spectacular group of student leaders called the Student Advisory Council. Our school superintendent has pulled them together, and they've actually been hosting town halls since last spring when there was an incident of gun violence in one of the high schools, and they really wanted a platform to respond to that. And so what we've done is um, continue, just offered them an opportunity to continue that series of town halls um, with our program, which is called Teens Take on the Four Freedoms. And this will be a chance for them to kind of expand that conversation, talk about what they value, um, what they're thinking about, what they're worried about in the context of school and beyond. Kate, are you seeing any kind of uh, reaction in the community that is directly related to your bringing up this talk at, topic and making it part of a, an open forum? I'm curious to know what kind of responses you're getting. People have been really positive about the exhibition so far, but it only opened on September 8th. We haven't even been open for a month yet. Um, So I think it will take us some time to get a better sense of how people are feeling overall. That said, we also have um, an opportunity for visitors to the exhibition to respond in the exhibition. We have kind of a big, colorful wall full of sticky notes with people articulating what they're grateful for, um, uh, freedom of or freedom from. And that has been covered already in these incredible sticky notes. And so I feel like people are responding well to the installation. 
That's great. I think that when people feel that they can participate in an art museum, it, it encourages that freedom of expression, which is the end goal um, to all of this. And, and are you seeing your attendance in the museum changing at all? Or, or is this kind of outreach typical of what you do to get people in the community to enjoy the arts in the museum? I was, I was going to say our attendance generally has been growing, and I think it's because um, as a department of the city of Birmingham and as an institution that's really focused on our local community, we have pivoted to having constant conversations with our local community. So this is just one installation in a number, a string of programs that we've been doing targeted to the people around us, and it really has brought the community in, I think. Um, into a conversation with the museum and into the museum's walls, which is exciting. That's very exciting. Uh, what other kinds of uh, shows have you done uh, in an effort to bring people into the conversation in Bur- Birmingham and, and get that participation going? Well, we've really tried to... Um, to highlight art from Alabama as well as art that speaks to Birmingham, whether it's historic or contemporary. And so I think two exhibitions in particular that we've um, presented recently that do that are are one on um, 1930s prints of Birmingham, which was called Magic City Realism, Richard Coe's Birmingham. And again, we really asked people to think about what their city looks like today as compared to their city in the 1930s. And then currently we have another exhibition that's open. It's called Third Space, Shifting Conversations in Contemporary Art. And Third Space really thinks about the American South as a place as well as the global South. And it's really speaking to questions of sort of um, race in America, race beyond America, um, questions that are relevant to the daily lives of Birmingham citizens. And so we're really well, we're trying to shape our programming them. around our community. That's that's wonderful, and we're going to talk more with Kate Crawford, who is the curator at the Birmingham Museum of Art, af- about their programming at the museum, and we're going to be taking a short break right now. This is Gwenda Joyce, the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and I'm here today with Kate Crawford, who is telling us about the fantastic programs going on at the Birmingham Museum of Art. And I'm curious to know more about the third space exhibition you have, Kate. Where did the title come from, and how did that show develop? Well, so the title of Third Space is actually borrowed from um, theorist Homi Baba's term, Third Space, which is really um, him defining a kind of a space that uh, unifies a particular group of people. Um, it's more conceptual and more global. And uh, so, too, then, is the exhibition. It's the first large-scale exhibition of our contemporary art collection, And it draws together works of art made not only in the American South, but also things that relate to them from this sort of global post-colonial moment. And you have also um, partnered with uh, other organizations in Birmingham in order to um, expand your programming and your audience. Uh, uh, And I understand that the Southern Poverty Law Center is one of those partners. How has that Uh, taken place? Um, We have partnered with the Southern Poverty Law Center for the Four Freedoms Exhibition, and that's building on work that we do with all of our exhibitions, um, whether it's Third Space or the Magic City Realism Exhibition I mentioned before. Um, In the context of the Four Freedoms Exhibition, we're partnering with the Southern Poverty Law Center, and in particular, their Alabama Voting Rights Project, which is working on voter restoration. So we think about... um, historic questions of voting in the context of the exhibition. And then we've also been working with these voter restoration events, um, in particular with the yard signs being installed tomorrow as part of our yard sign installation uh, to allow people who've recently had their voting rights restored to articulate what they value freedom of and freedom from. Well, I'm so impressed with this whole program uh, and to get a sense of the inclusiveness of it. Uh, it's not something that is just staying in the 
museum and an exhibition, but it's really reaching out into the community. And this is sort of part of the idea behind Four Freedoms and their initiative to invite people to think about um, participating in different ways and having this be an art-based or an expression-based uh, kind of engagement. Uh, one of the things they're also doing is, as part of the Four Freedoms Initiative, which Kate mentioned earlier, is that there's been a billboard campaign. And the billboard campaign is is really interesting because to me because it's uh, of course it's very visual and it takes place in a way that is really large and hard to miss i mean we all know what billboards are like and so the billboard campaign uh, has been a, kind of a seminal idea that different artists and and uh partners have taken up in their own way. And one of those is in the city of Chicago, where their um, the city itself and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events uh, partnered with Four Freedoms and created a citywide uh, initiative during the time of the Expo Chicago, which, which is a major international art fair that was held last weekend in Chicago. And so the uh, program included commissioning a, one of the Chicago-based artists, Theaster Gates, uh, to do a billboard. And then 10 other artists who are represented by the galleries participating in Expo Chicago were also invited to do billboards and to put them up throughout the city of Chicago. So as you, if you are able to get to Chicago or if you're in Chicago, you will see art-oriented billboards all throughout the city. Uh, this is unusual because it's uh, a visual that we usually think of advertising. And by giving it over to artists, the intention is to kind of co-opt that advertising language and turn it into a way to engage people with the medium of billboards and advertising in a dynamic way and to continue a conceptual dialogue that goes along with the existing art projects that artists are already working on. Um, the real intention is to extend the visual and the messaging differently. Uh, um, one of the most uh, prominent ones in Chicago is, as I mentioned, done by Theaster Gates, and it's visible from the highway as you're going into downtown Chicago, and it's on a pedestrian level on the street. And Gates's latest series is called Black Madonna, and it's presented on this big screen, configured from the selections of his most recent body of work that relates to artworks that were collected and are in the collection of the Johnson Publishing Archives. Uh, the Johnson Publishing Company is a Chicago-based uh, publishing company and a longtime supporter of the arts and collector of artworks. So the site is both embedded within and critically engaged with uh, the dialogue surrounding Gates's work. And this is done intentionally um, using a big billboard. I understand it was show-stopping. I don't have, uh, didn't have the opportunity to be in Chicago, but many of you know that I was the owner of a gallery in Chicago for many years. So Chicago and its kind of big way of presenting art and bringing it into the landscape in terms of public art and public uh, commitment to visual art and all of the arts is something that really I identify with. Uh, it formed me in a very positive way. Um, so I was excited to hear about this uh, billboard project and the partnership with Four Freedoms that is occurring in Chicago right now. Uh, we're going to be talking more about the impact of the Four Freedoms partner initiatives when we come back after our short break. 
I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and this is the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm also the author of Nine Steps to Artistic Freedom, Living the Artist's Life, and Making It Sustainable. We're going to be talking more after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and we're on BBM Global Network. We've been talking today about the Four Freedoms organization that has launched its 50-state initiative, the largest creative collaboration in our nation's history. Their goal is to encourage broad participation and inspire conversation around November's midterm elections. My next guest is Courtney Gilbert, who is the Curator of Art at the Sun Valley Center for the Arts in Ketchum, Idaho. Welcome to the show, Courtney. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very much interested in hearing the story behind your uh, organization's uh, interest in presenting a program around this theme. And I think it has a real direct tie-in to your programming from the past. You have something called Big Ideas Programs. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, so we're a multidisciplinary arts organization. So in addition to our visual arts program, we also um, we have a theater company, Company of Fools. Um, we have a really strong performing arts and lecture series. We show film, um, and we do all kinds of educational programming. So two to three times a year, all of our different arts disciplines come together to explore a topic or an idea that we think has relevance to our time and place. Um, and about, it was actually about 17 months ago or, or 18 months ago, we started, you know, coming out of the 2016 election, I, there was, I think, a sense of um, a lot of division within the country. There was a sense that people were asking questions about how they could be active politically and what it looks like to be not only an engaged citizen, but also a patriotic citizen. Um, and so we started working on a big idea project that we've called We the People, Protest and Patriotism. And it's really um, an examination of the role of participation in American democracy and also the need for participation and the different forms that participation can take, whether it's, you know, just showing up to vote, which every one of us should be doing, especially, you know, coming up in November, or running for local office, showing up at your city council meetings or town hall. We're going to be talking more after this short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network. I'm Gwenda Joyce, your host, and I'm here with Courtney Gilbert, who is telling us about the exhibition, We the People, Protest and Patriotism, uh, that is currently on exhibit at the Sun Valley Center for the Arts. And Courtney, I'd like to know more about your, uh, what you decided to include in this exhibition and what are the ideas that are included from the various artists who are participating. It's such a broad topic. Can you break it down for sure. us? Yeah. So one of the things that was important to us was to give kind of a historical context for um, the ways that people have been civically engaged throughout the history of the country. Um, and so I was able to borrow a number of historic materials from the Wolfsonian Museum in Miami Beach, which has a fabulous collection of all kinds of um, design materials and also printed posters and brochures from most of the 20th century. And in their collection, they had a number of brochures that were made for May Day marches in New York City in the 1930s and 1940s. They had um, flyers from peace marches in the 1950s. They had uh, this wonderful brochure that was produced as part of a a, a march for women's suffrage in the UK, actually, in 1914. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the messages we were trying to drive home is that throughout the country's history, people have organized publicly in order to speak out, um, either against what they perceive as injustice or 
in favor of policy changes. So, you know, the labor marches that occurred in New York in the 1930s led eventually to the passage of the Social Security Act and the 40-hour work week and the minimum wage. Um, so, you know, I think giving kind of historical context to the conversation we're having was important. And then there are um, uh, six contemporary artists whose work is in the exhibition. Um, Deborah Ashheim is, she's based in Los Angeles, and her entire practice is really focused on the idea of memory. And she she's very interested in memory at both kind of a clinical neuroscience level. So she's done a, a lot of work about the human brain, but more recently she's been looking at collective social memory um, and especially how what the role that images play in how we remember our history. So she's pursued several projects where she's gone through newspaper archives and um, taken oral histories from people who were either active in or, or witness to student protests in California in the 1960s and 1970s. And she's made these just gorgeous um, ink and watercolor drawings on mylar that we have based on these historic archival photos. And then, you know, since 2017, she's been attending um, marches in California and elsewhere that are happening in the contemporary moment and making drawings of participants at those. You know, so there's this interesting conversation between what was happening 50 years ago in our country, what's happening today, what issues are still relevant, um, how protest has changed. Uh, so it's been kind of a pleasure to have those in the exhibition um, as, as part of this conversation about past and present. It's um, so important, Kate, I think. Yeah, I, would, I wanted to make a comment that it is so important to revisit yeah. our history and to uh, bring these things from the past into our present awareness uh, because of the constantly changing nature of of the world and the different focus that we have, we forget uh, that the younger generation is coming up quickly and hasn't experienced the same history that uh, the older generations have. So the yeah. information is constantly changing and visual communication, uh, you know, through art, through uh, visual presentations really c does uh, communicate uh, this important uh, history and as mm -hmm. I'm, re I'm reminded of a comment that someone made. I can't think of who it was, but recently I, I uh, it came in front of my page of whatever I was reading that if we don't understand our history, we don't know ourselves. We don't understand yeah. ourselves, and I think yeah. that is just so important in what you're describing about your exhibition with the people. Um, what are some of the other artists doing uh, in presenting yeah. their ideas in this exhibition? So we have work by an, uh, also a California-based artist named Kate Haug, who, like Deborah Ashheim, is looking um, at the the turmoil of the 1960s and the public actions that resulted in that time. And we have um, some work from a project she did on Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign of 1968. Um, and then we have these really fantastic photographs that uh, Paul Shambroom, who's based in Minneapolis, has made. He made them actually um, almost 20 years ago. In 1999, he started a project he called Meetings, where he would take road trips and travel the country visiting small towns, attending city council meetings in towns, you know, with populations anywhere from just a few hundred people up to a couple thousand people. And he'd, he'd sit, you know, like any, any citizen attending these meetings, he'd sit um, in the meeting space and take photographs of the people who are making government and making policy at the grassroots level. Um, so they're, and they're printed on canvas, really large, so they're kind of heroic, but also very charming and a little bit funny, um, images of, of government in action at the small town level. Because, you know, I think one of the points we're trying to drive home is that there are lots of different ways to participate, and one is to run for city council, or and another is to show up at these public meetings. Um, and then Mel Ziegler has, you know, from 
2011 to 2016, he pursued a project he called Flag Exchange, where he exchanged um, a new flag for an old tattered flag from pe- with people living in each of the 50 states. Um, and it was a really, uh, you know, kind of a fascinating look at what the flag means across the political spectrum. Why do people... Um, why do people fly the flags? What does it mean to them? Why do they continue to fly flags that are um, kind of distressed and falling apart? The United States flag code describes the flag as a living thing, and that idea is really key to his project. And here we have a new project that he's just finished, which consists of 16 exchanged flags. So we have old distressed flags that are all three by five feet and are hanging from our ceiling. And they're each embroidered with one of the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner. So he's marrying this song that has, you know, its own life with, with the idea of the flag as a living thing. Um, I'm so curious. I'm so curious to know, uh, since I'm not standing in that position Uh of seeing 16 flags, uh, huge flags, three by five feet, is hanging from a wall. Uh, some in, yeah. some are tattered, some are new. Um, what kind of reaction does it bring up in you as you uh, look walk into this room and see that display? The flag is such a, a potent symbol. Yeah. It, Can it you is articulate it? You know, yeah. and there for me. The flag, the flags. So all of the flags that he has collected are are old tattered flags, um, and I had not, frankly, read the the U.S. flag code. I didn't understand the idea of the flag as a living thing. But the more I think about it as an object with a life cycle, um, it kind of for me it represents the idea of this country as a living thing and as an an a, a living body that's constantly in the process of evolution and change. And that we're always reshaping it, all of us as citizens, in whatever way we can through our own participation. Well, that is such an important message. And sometimes we forget that, uh, as they say, change is the only constant. Yeah, and it, exactly. it, you know, we want things to stay the same. And sometimes even yeah. when we look at an image, we think it's embedded that way forever. But an image itself can yeah. be a fleeting, fleeting, changing thing. And so we have yeah. to remember to bring our sense of presence to whatever images we see and realize that uh, the underlying principle, it, it just makes me, it reminds me that the underlying principle of the four freedoms is that democracy is not an ideology. It's a, yeah. it's a particip- participation. It's about having broad participation. And your exhibition yeah. sounds like it really brought so many images to bear to remind us of this. I'm curious to know, uh, here, you are a curator. You're constantly out looking at images mm-hmm. and fielding and, and learning about what artists are doing, uh, contemporary and historical. So how did mm-hmm. you find, where did these ideas, uh, these artists' uh, works come to you uh, over the course of time yeah. or was this a new interest of yours? Yeah, yeah no, they, it, um, you know, and I, I, I do live in, in central Idaho, so I'm <laughs> somewhat isolated. Um, and I, re- uh-huh. I rely heavily on getting, um, material by email from artists and galleries and museums. Um, but I, you know, I had worked with Deborah Ashheim twice before and actually it's really interesting because the projects I've worked with her on kind of map the evolution of her career. The first one was really about um, the idea of neural architecture and, and the memory within the brain. The second project was more about family memory and how memory gets transmitted from generation to generation. And, and now we're looking at social memory through her new drawings. Um, and Deborah introduced me to Kate Haug's work. I, had, uh, I hadn't heard of it before, and, and Deborah sent me um, a brochure from a, an exhibition they were both in together. And Kate, Kate's actually the person who connected me to Four Freedoms. I had heard about the Billboard Project, and I've, I'm a longtime fan of Hank Willis Thomas's work, but I didn't know about the extent of the 50-state initiative. So through Kate, 
Um, I, I emailed them just this summer and was lucky to be able to link our institution to them as a 30 state or sorry, as a 50 state um, initiative partner. Well, there and is, I guess, like, uh, oh, sorry. seven, six, de- six degrees of separation exists yeah, in the art exactly. world as well as everywhere yeah. else. Well, Kate Croft, yeah. uh, Courtney Gilbert uh, of the Sun Valley Center for the Arts, uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you about your exhibition, We the People, Protest and Patriotism, and it is uh, ongoing now and until it closes. What is the closing date? Yeah, December 14th, and we've got lots of related programming throughout the fall. Well, it's been a fantastic uh, and illuminating topic, and we're going to be talking more about the Four Freedoms Initiative uh, when we come back. I'm Gwenda Joyce, your host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and we're on BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. Today, I've been talking about the Four Freedoms Partner Initiative, which is a an organization that has inspired and produced special exhibitions and town hall meetings and billboard projects and lawn, lawn signed installations and all sorts of public organizational arts activities to spur greater participation in civic life. And uh, It's just so important now at this time when the elections are coming up and there's a lot of energy around encouraging us each as individuals to exercise our right to vote. Uh, Four Freedoms has launched its 50-state initiative as the largest creative collaboration in our nation's history. And as we've heard from um, Courtney Gilbert, who is the curator at the Sun Valley Center for the Arts, and Kate Crawford, who is the curator at the Birmingham Museum of the Arts, uh, my two guests today, uh, they've been able to put together some really dynamic programming, and their intention is to reach out into the community and uh, invite everyone to think about the participation that they want to have, that each of us wants to have in our democracy. So I want to thank both of my guests for being on the show today and encourage you to check out the website at forfreedoms.org. It's spelled F-O-R freedoms.org, even though it does refer to the four freedoms uh, that were referred to uh, in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's speech way back in 1941. So you can also look around your neighborhood to see if there are any billboards or any projects and programs going on in your own communities. Um, This is a, a huge initiative and it only gets better when you as a viewer uh, can participate and be a part of that dialogue. So it's up to all of us to get involved. And this is just a start, I think, but it's a great start. I'm really impressed with the way that a lot of organizations are reaching out for all of us to be to stand up and be counted, to make our voices heard, to express ourselves respectfully, and to respect the voices of others. Uh, this is something that's really important to me and why I... Uh, put on the radio show, the Art Ambassador Radio Show, and I invite you to listen and send your comments in. You can either put comments on the blog or send them to me at gwenda at artambassador.net. As I mentioned, I had a gallery in Chicago for over 20 years, and thinking back, the art world has changed there as everywhere. It's big, diverse, Um, always receptive and responsive to what's going on. But oftentimes, if you're an artist or an art lover even, you might want to work with a guide to help you connect the dots if you're interested in learning more about art or if you're an artist and you want to build your career and 
expand your business so that your voice can be heard in a larger way and so that you can connect with the people and the institutions that are a good partnership for you. I'm passionate about doing this and I help artists succeed and get their art out there in the world in a bigger way. And I would like to invite you to contact me if this is something you feel like you have a, that's a missing piece but you would like to have more connection about. Um, I offer a free consultation, a free phone conversation to pinpoint your biggest challenges and we can come to some sort of understanding about how to move forward from there. So I invite you to go to artambassador.net slash apply to us and fill out the form. I'd look forward to talking with you and having you back on the Art Ambassador radio show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce. See you next time.